I tū ana a hau, i raro e te maro o tāne, i whakapiri nei i ina ia tātou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ko ma tātoa te waka, ko ngā puhi te iwi, ko ngā tirehi a te hapu, ko mangaiti te marae, ko Deidre Brown tāko ingoa. Built, lost, recovered or reimagined, Māori architecture defines the settlement of Aotearoa and the enduring connections that Māori have to our whenua. The New Zealand War's urbanisation and housing crises have, all have architectural outcomes and the resolution of these events has and will require an architectural solution. Along with access to fresh water and food, shelter is a fundamental requirement for all human life. Therefore, understanding shelter through the discipline of architecture reveals the methods Māori ancestors used to occupy places that became their tūranga waiwai by establishing seasonal encampments that eventually became kāinga. These were serviced and protected by pā, the monumental landscape modifications that have their origins in Western and Central Polynesian stone and earth architecture. Our kāinga were supported by a cultural landscape that included awa and moana as highways and harvesting grounds. Research and oral narratives have shown the extent to which watercraft construction technologies have informed architectural construction technologies and vice versa, and thus our highways and harvesting grounds are connected to our whenua. My pepeha acknowledges my whakapapa connection to this architectural and cultural infrastructure. But I also have another architectural whakapapa in which one of the tipuna is this man, Sir Christopher Wren, architect, most notably of St Paul's Cathedral, Latin scholar, Minister of Parliament and founder of the Royal Society, becoming president in 1680. Now in Wren's time, a jack of all trades could become a master of many. His architectural practice was founded on scientific observation and measuring the natural and built worlds as creatively manifested through invention and building. As an architecturally trained Māori art and architectural historian who currently leads the largest school of architecture and planning in the country, I work across disciplines to assist iwi and hapū in their aspirations and educate the next generation of architects. The concepts of whakapapa, rangatiratanga, tikanga and whenua pervade all aspects of Māori art and architecture. And I've discovered this through, and I must thank the Royal Society very much, uh, through a Marsden grant that has allowed us to work with a number of communities in looking at the history of Māori art and architecture, which we will publish this year. It is coming. So my research is concerned about how art and architectural practice respond when whakapapa, rangatiratanga, tikanga and whenua are under threat. The devastation of the New Zealand wars is architecturally evident in the fight to defend kainga from occupation, the confiscation, confiscation and destruction of whare by colonial forces, and the rise of new and diverse Māori architectural responses that sought to keep us on our whenua. Recording this diversity through a whakapapa approach to architectural history was the objective of my early academic work, which investigated the inheritance of technologies and formalisms between the kingitanga, paimarare, ringatū and rātana movements and the settlements of parihaka and mongopōhatu. The materials and styles might have changed, but the tikanga and kopapa remained the same, a lesson that we need to keep taking forward to create culturally responsive and responsible architecture. From this research emerged the story of Sir Apirana Ngata as an architectural revivalist, ethnologist, Latin scholar and member of parliament. What Christopher Wren was to Pākehā society, Sir Apirana Ngāta was to Māori society. Ngāta had little time to publish. 
and the record of most of his architectural contribution can be found in his Native Affairs correspondence down the road in Archives New Zealand. And I spent many, many months working through their archives as a student. It was, it was a truly wonderful time. Ngata believed that the 19th century whare nui and marae united Māori culture and that they could do so again in the 20th century through the School of Māori Arts and Crafts that he founded in 1926. The architectural renaissance he inspired revived whare whakairo or decorated whare nui construction and catalyzed marae development. Mirata Kafaru rightfully talks of the 21st century marae as being the last bastions of tikanga and te reo, as all other Māori built infrastructure around them, including the kainga, has been progressively lost through land alienation in its various forms. And I would like to acknowledge the work of another Te Aparangi Fellow who was appointed today, Michelle Fawcett-Thompson, who works in planning in this area. Just as we can measure where Māori society is thriving in our architecture, I and other scholars have identified where whenua is under threat through identifying what we term endangered architecture. Pātaka or Māori storehouses where hunting, fishing and sometimes gardening equipment were kept were important in numerous Māori buildings in Kainga before the late 19th century. They contained all that was necessary to maintain traditional lifeways on traditional land holdings under traditional law. Recent research with my master's student Ambrosia Crum has shown that the locations of the 12 surviving pātaka that exist outside of museums map onto surviving Māori land holdings. A glimmer of hope for the recovery of traditional Māori lifeways on whenua Māori can be seen in efforts to build new pātaka. So we will be able to tell the health of our whenua through multiple tools, and we've heard many of them discussed this morning, but I would suggest that the pātaka, the revival of the pātaka, is a measurement of bringing back together again traditional life ways, traditional land holdings, and traditional law. The kōta, or cookhouse, is another once ubiquitous and now endangered architecture due to its purpose in construction, sitting outside of local, uh, and building, uh, local body and building regulations. The kota is, I believe, the precedent for both modern farekai kitchens and the function of the domestic dining table as a place of gathering and storytelling in Māori homes. And I know that that idea of gathering around the kitchen table uh, to discuss stories will have meaning to many of you. Those kōta that remain on marae are an essential part of our food culture and food sovereignty and a space for informal and influential discussion outside of whare nui contexts. However, they are also currently regarded as fire and earthquake risks due to the use of unreinforced masonry and open fire. Two current kōta research projects include one by um, Mai Whanaunga, Waitangi Woods, a Scion-funded uh, investigation to protect those still standing, and also another by Jade Kake and Matakohi Architects, which you can see on the images on the right-hand side, to create new legally compliant ones. Housing and its supply and quality are the most pressing issues confronting our country. This is not a new problem, despite what the media suggests. It is a long-running, working-class and predominantly Māori and Pacific one that is now also affecting middle-class Pākehā. And hence, I would say this is why it's so topical at the moment. The role of urbanisation and land and housing procurement legislation in creating the situation is well understood. As I and others have argued elsewhere, the, uh, the intergenerational pathway to houselessness and homelessness begins with landlessness for Māori. The research of Te Aparangi Fellows Michael Baker and Philippa Howden Chapman has provided an important framework for understanding the relationship between serious disease and unhealthy housing and has proposed remediation through improving the livability of private and state rental accommodation, all of which is of benefit to Māori. 
Only the construction or retrofitting of good quality, affordable housing en masse that is culturally responsive will address this problem. And uh, here I show an example of Tor Architects Māori Modular housing proposal. We need to restore the mana of state housing. We need to restore the mana of rental housing to move forward. And I would say that long-term solutions must come from architectural, planning and land economics research, not just from population health, sociology or engineering. I look forward to contributing to the work of the Royal Society New Zealand Te Aparangi as a fellow. Thank you for the taonga of the fellowship. I do not underestimate the mana of this mantle and the mana of the tohu you have given me today. It places me in a whakapapa of scholars who I greatly admire. I share this korawai with my whānau who support and maintain me, some of whom are here today. Uh, Dr. Tanya Slater of Victoria University of Wellington, um, Camille Dentis of the Reserve Bank, and I acknowledge her husband here today too. Thank you very much for coming. Holly Hart of the Medical Council. These are my cousins, great cousins and great, great cousins. Uh, also my husband Grant and my sons Maximilian, a Latin scholar, and Oscar too. So I acknowledge the journey we've been on and last night we reflected on what a big maunga this has been to climb, particularly for um, our mothers, Camille, in getting here. They had very difficult lives. So I will ensure that the mana that comes with this fellowship is used for the benefit of our many communities. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa, kia ora.